time to stop, start talking about the incoherencies of asking us, uh, you know, in the name of energy independence, to somehow uh, give up all the things that we, we hold dear um, to engage in this form of energy uh, extraction. So I'm going to close now with um, a little bit of a, uh, with some reading, and I promised I would make this as musical as possible, so uh, this is a little bit of a musical experiment. Let's see how this works. Uh, this is uh, a meditation on water from my, uh, my most recent book, Raising Elijah, um, which is largely about environmental threats to children's health, um, but talks a lot about fracking because I think uh, that's the biggest threat to this generation of children that I can think of. Uh, and so um, this uh, section I'm going to read is not about the poisoning of water, but it's about something else that happens during fracking, which is the disappearance of water. You know, when we, um, when we entomb water inside deep geological strata, it's no longer connected to the water cycle. Um, it's not connected to the, our water table. It's not groundwater anymore. It's not rain. It's not surface water. It's basically uh, has disappeared. And humans have never done that in large amounts. So all the water that's ever here on Earth has been here forever. Um, and it just kind of goes around in this great cycle. And, and humans have never made, never destroyed water before. But that's part of what fracking does, and it does it in really large quantities. So, I, uh, so that inspired me to write this. And then I've got two other... Uh, uh, meditations on water that I'll close with that don't have anything to do with fracking, but I hope put us in the right kind of frame of mind as we go forward with this. Fracking makes water disappear. This is worth thinking hard about. Usually when we say that water is being wasted because, say, some misinformed soul opens a car wash in the middle of the desert, we don't mean that water itself exits the water cycle. Washing water might draw down a reserve or deplete an aquifer, but the water itself is merely transferred to a different place on the proverbial wheel, which is forever turning. When you brush your teeth, water flows via plumbing from a municipal well to a sewage treatment plant and then heads down the river to somewhere else. It's not really gone, although the resulting depletion of aquifers is nevertheless a hugely serious problem. When a farmer pumps groundwater to irrigate a field, the moisture enters the root hairs of the crop plant, exits the stomata of leaves, rises as vapor to the clouds, and comes back down as rain. If not falling on some watershed from whence it came, then maybe falling on another one a couple time zones away, or on all the ships at sea. Conversely, what happens to water during fracking is different to what happens to water when you brush your teeth and leave the tap on. When a single well is fracked, several million gallons of fresh water are removed from lakes and streams or from groundwater aquifers and are entombed in deep geological strata up to a mile or more below the water table. Once there, it is removed from the water cycle permanently, as in forever. It will no longer swirl with tadpoles or ripple with fish. It will no longer ascend into clouds, freeze into snowflakes, melt into rivulets, cascade over rocks, Turn with the tide, soak into soil, rise through roots, or flow from your tap. It will never again become blood, tears, sweat, urine, milk, sap, nectar, yolk, honey, or the juice of a fruit. It will never again float a leaf boat, swell a bud, quench a thirst, fill a swamp, spill over an edge, slosh, dribble, spray, trickle, splash, drip, or glisten. Never again fog, mist, frost, ice, dew, or rain. It's gone. Not that you would want it to come back. It's poisonous now. And from my book of uh, poetry, Post Diagnosis, this is a poem called Groundwater. And the scene here is a, uh, this, the speaker is a woman whose friend has just died of breast cancer. And she's been asked to go find a photograph um, from the family album to uh, use for the obituary. Groundwater. Why your picture in the morning paper surprises me, I don't know. I was the one who drove from the hospital to your mother's house, let myself in with a borrowed key, rummaged through the figurines and plants and china cups like a thief until I found the family album. I was the one who turned each plastic coated page. I was the one who noticed there were no pictures of you by yourself. 
how you positioned yourself in the middle of the rest of us as if you had planned to stay with the living always, how impossible you made this choosing. And I was the one who said, here is one that might work. Your son sat next to me on the couch. They'll have to crop it, I said. What do you think? Whatever he said was inaudible, and I was the one who peeled that photograph from the gummy adhesive, aware that the dead are always culled from the living like this, and I was the one who handed that picture to the funeral director. Someone else correctly spelled the names of the survivors. That was last night. This morning, as though night and day were any different, you are the one who smiles alone above your obituary, and I, who saw the sun rise five times from your hospital window, am surprised. I buy a second copy of the newspaper and then a third. I want to buy all the copies of the newspaper, but I know you are already lying on a thousand porches, stacked beside a thousand drugstore counters, locked inside a thousand metal boxes that even now the coins are dropping into. You are the one who taught me that an aspirin added to the water of cut flowers will preserve them. Smash the vase, named survivor. Let the funeral flowers be flung from the water. Let the half-dissolved tablet eat a hole in the floorboard. As the dead evaporate, the living behave like water. We want to fall. We want to run through the gullies to the bottom lands, mingle with dirt, lie down with roots and worms, turn paper back to pulp, leach through rocks, be pulled underground. Under the earth, a thousand rivers flow. On the far banks, the dead are massing, wrapped in white hospital blankets, waving arms encircled with plastic name tags, their faces unsurprised, indivisible. And from death to birth. This is a scene from uh, my book, Having Faith, named after my daughter, Faith, who is now 12. And I'll leave it to you. Imagine why a cancer patient would have a child to name her faith. This is the scene of another ultrasound I received. Um, I actually did lie down on the same ultrasound table in Boston where I had once been scanned for signs of tumor. And I had to remember that this time when they see signs of growth, it's a good thing and not a bad thing. I have a peculiar habit whenever I go uh, through stressful medical techniques, I think about biological phenomenon that I'm particularly fond of, which is why when I uh, did the uh, ultrasound and cystoscope uh, the other month, I was thinking about the water cycle. Um, in this um, ultrasound, I was thinking about hummingbirds, so you'll hear some of the interior monologue of that. Suddenly, the tiny room fills up with women. My obstetrician walks in and greets me warmly. The technician and the chief sonographer take their places and begin flipping switches and unwrapping the assembled objects. The mood is buoyant. They begin quickly. The dome of my belly is bared to the ultrasound probe, which looks like the kind of spoon that you eat Japanese soup with. The probe locates a pocket of fluid safely away from the body of the fetus. The needle slides in about two inches below my navel. A second later, as it passes through the uterus, I feel a sharp cramp. Muscles do this when they are stuck with needles. Everyone else is watching this moment on the screen of the ultrasound monitor. I am not. I am thinking very hard about hummingbirds. The nests of hummingbirds are constructed of spider webs and dandelion down. They are lined with lichens and moss. They usually contain two eggs. I glance down briefly. The syringe is half full of fluid already. The eggs are the size of peas. When baby hummingbirds hatch, they look like wet bumblebees. The first syringe is replaced by a second. Hummingbirds fly over the Gulf of Mexico from the Yucatan in a single night. It's a distance of, oh, 500 miles. Some of them probably came across last night, assuming the high pressure system over New England extends all the way down there. The second syringe is taking longer to fill up. I don't like hummingbirds. Up close, they're too small. Too much nervous, insect-like worrying. Still, the entire gulf in a single flight is impressive. You have to admit that. The needle is out. We're done. The mood is still upbeat. The obstetrician hands the pair of vials to the technician who holds them up to the light like glasses of fine wine. Nice color, she says. Do you want to hold them? And she passes the vials hot as blood into my hands. The fluid inside is pale gold. It seems to glow. 
It's like liquid amber, I sputter. Amniotic fluid, it's like an amber jewel. It occurs to me amniotic fluid is the loveliest substance I've ever seen. The obstetrician touches my arm. That's baby pee, she says, smiling. <laughs> we like it yellow. It's a sign of good kidney functioning. I look at the vials again. Oh, right, I say. Drink plenty of water today. The obstetrician is finishing up. Drink plenty of water, she says. Before his baby pee, amniotic fluid is water. I drink water, and it becomes blood plasma, which suffuses through the amniotic sac and surrounds the baby who also drinks it. And what is it before that? Before it is drinking water, amniotic fluid is the creeks and rivers that fill reservoirs. It is the underground water that fills wells. When I hold in my hands a tube of my own amniotic fluid, I am holding a tube full of raindrops. Amniotic fluid is the juice of oranges I had for breakfast, the milk I poured over my cereal, the maple syrup I stirred in. It is the green cells of spinach leaves and the damp flesh of apples. It is the yolk of an egg. When I look at amniotic fluid, I am looking at rain falling on apple orchards. I am looking at melon fields, potatoes in wet earth, frost on pasture grasses. The nectar gathered by hummingbirds is in this tube. Whatever is inside hummingbird eggs is also inside me. Whatever is in the world's water is here in my hands. Whatever is in the world's water is here in our hands and is inside of us. Thank you. <laughs>